Good morning, everyone, and a very warm welcome to this webinar, Understanding the Economic Impacts of COVID-19, Macro and Local Government Perspectives. I'm Ashley Moore, uh, Corporate Communications Manager here at SIPFA, and I will be moderating today's discussion. This is one of a series of webinars that SIPFA is hosting, where we're examining a range of issues for the public finance professionals that are emanating from the current pandemic, issues from the professional and the technical right through to the personal. So today we're taking a look at the economic impact of the coronavirus. As the UK economy emerges from the depths of an acute recession, the landscape is lined with fragile expectations and great uncertainty. We'll be exploring what the recovery will mean for local government spending and its ability to provide a swath of public services that are needed now more than ever. We'll be looking at how increased demand we funded given the economic realities of the lockdown and what this will mean for the government's levelling up agenda. Now, before I introduce our two speakers, I want to remind everyone that we do want this to be an interactive event, and this is an opportunity for you to put your questions and comments forward to our panel for them to respond to and discuss. You're able to submit a question via the question panel on the GoToWebinar dashboard that you should have on your screen. Once the presentations have concluded, I will put those forward to our speakers. So please, you can submit a question at any time. There is no need to wait until the end of the presentation. So to discuss this topic today, I'm delighted to introduce two fantastic speakers. We have Jeffrey Matsu, who is SIPFA's Chief Economist, and David Phillips, the Associate Director from the Institute of Fiscal Studies. So Jeff, it will be our first speaker. In his role with SIPFA, Jeff works with partner governments, accountancy bodies, and the public sector around the world to advance public finance and support better public services. Previously, Jeff was responsible for market analysis and thought leadership at the Royal Institution of Chartered Surveyors and co-led the economy theme at the UK Collaborative Centre for Housing Evidence. So I will be now be handing over to Jeff to begin his presentation. Good morning and thank you for the uh, welcome. Um, thank you to everyone who's joined this uh, webinar and hopefully everyone is doing well during these challenging times. Um, the hope of this webinar is to give some background information of where we view the UK economy is today and where we see it prospectively going and then to switch it over to my colleague at the IFS David, who will then talk a bit about what's happening with consumer spending um, in, within households and the effect that will have on uh, what the repercussions will be for local governments, both in terms of their ability to spend and um, deliver um, services that communities rely on. So going to the first slide, um, Uh, okay, um, so the outlook is, um, this is basically what the outlook was before the, uh, the coronavirus hit us. Um, we were a country very much in a state of uncertainty with Brexit negotiations, and that seems to be a world away today. We forget that before entering the current public health crisis, there was just a lot of uncertainty in terms of where the country um, was currently and what our aspirations was in terms of defining a future going forward. Now that we've layered on the public health crisis, this very um, foggy outlook has basically become um, nearly impossible to predict. And so a lot of what I will be talking about today are really just impressions of where we think things might be headed. But given that you have these two um, colliding forces of uncertainty um, with Brexit having to be dealt with later this year, we do just need to be very, quite explicit that um, the outlook um, rests on a lot of assumptions, some of them quite heroic in nature. Um, but the, uh, the hope is that through this exercise, we get a better sense of what might be based on um, some, uh, some data and looking back um, on the past to inform us of where we might be headed going forward. For the next slide, um, Ashley. Uh, the slide doesn't seem to be 
Okay. Um, so this is looking back um, for quite some time. It's quite a busy chart, but what I wanted to show here is that where we are today, um, the first quarter of this year, uh, GDP fell by 2%. And I think it's quite important when we look at where we are today to hold it within context of what's happened in the past. So you can see that this is quite a sizable shock because if you compare it to what was happening during the great financial crisis in 2008, um, you can see that just in the first quarter alone, um, we basically, a GDP has fallen to about that same um, uh, 2% mark. Um, this is quite significant because the lockdown only happened at the end of March. And so this, this drop in GDP performance reflects basically just nine days of of the lockdown. And so in terms of what lies ahead, um, there's quite a considerable um, shock that's in the cards. Right now we expect uh, Q2 GDP, the quarter that we're currently in, to fall anywhere between 20 to 30%. The IMF is um, eyeing uh, about that figure as well as the OBR, the Office for Budget. Um, So in terms of GDP, um, it fell by 20% in April. So that's last month. So that's quite a significant fall that um, really it marks a pre-COVID peak to trough decline since January of 25%. And again, that compares to 6% for the great financial crisis, which previously was the deepest um, fall in post-war history. Um, the output was most of that came from the services sector and um, we don't anticipate there being meaningful recovery in that area until July when restrictions on consumer service companies are expected to be lifted. Um, and also we are very well aware that the education sector is still, um, it started to lift in terms of opening up some year groups, but its um, output is still quite below par until the new academic year is expected to begin in September. Um, as I said, uh, the Monetary Policy Committee uh, in its latest um, assessment views Q2 GDP falling by 25%. The OBR sees a more precipitous drop of 25%. Um, where we feel the estimates may be, it's, um, Q1 was slightly less bad than what expectations were. And so something between the 20 to 30% range for the current quarter um, is, um, is, is quite practical to expect. Um, and it's also worth reminding that historically downturns are initially underestimated by the ONS. And so what we're seeing today as significant um, as it is in terms of weakness, um, when revisions come to the official data, um, it could be far worse. In terms of the next slide, um, this just shows um, I think I've skipped one, there we go. Um, this just shows the OECD's um, estimate of uh, what's happening across the G7. And I think it's instructive to keep the UK experience um, within context of what's happening with other countries um, within the advanced economy space. On average, um, across the G6 that are represented in this slide, output could fall by around a quarter and consumer spending by about a third. Um, and the UK um, mirrors this um, G7 average with about 26% fall in the GDP and 37% in um, consumer spending. This comes from the Monetary Policy Committee's um, most recent scenario assessment um, in its latest in its um, meeting last month. Um, it's not a forecast and that comes back to the point of what I mentioned at the beginning of this presentation, which is it's incredibly difficult to forecast anything. A lot of the scenarios today are based largely on assumptions and based on the assumptions that the Bank of England currently takes, it sees um, GDP for this year for 2020 as a whole falling by 14%, but having a fairly um, quick recovery in 2021, as you can see by the second to the right column. Um, so we have minus 14% and then 
rising swiftly back to 15% and then coming back to trend in 2022. Um, the OBR assesses the outcome in a similar way of a somewhat V-shaped recovery. And the risk here is that uh, we just simply don't know from an epidemiological perspective if there's going to be a second, a third, a subsequent waves of infection. And that will um, inform what materializes in the coming year, two year time horizon. Uh, but as you can see, it's not just the UK, this has affected the world as a whole. And based on IMF estimates, um, we're seeing a fairly sizable um, hit to world GDP um, and household savings, which, um, and as many of you will know, um, consumer spending um, comprises a very large share of, of economic activity in the advanced economies. To put where we are today in a very long-term historical perspective, the hit of minus 14, minus 15% is very significant. You would have to go back several centuries um, to see a growth hit that has been of uh, similar significance. And that is um, something that policy has responded to um, quite strongly and in a coordinated way. But it's worth noting that most of the short-term economic impacts come from people, not from people falling ill, but it's rather from the disruption to economic activity associated with the public health restrictions and social distancing requirements to control the spread of the disease. And so this is why we, along with many other economic um, forecasters, um, see a fairly swift rebound just based on historical precedents that um, once the these voluntary measures that government has put in place of locking down the economy are removed, um, are lifted, then economic activity should rebound quite quickly, barring uh, another wave of infections that require um, another form of lockdown. Um, and it's also worth remembering that during these trying times, the fundamental qualities that make an area, a city, a country attractive in the first place are still very much there. So cities such as London, um, other cities around the world, you know, if you're centrally located, you have, you know, good education, rule of law, um, all of these things are still very much there. So this is, uh, while this seems quite scary at the moment, um, it will pass. And when it does, many of the structural factors that support economic growth will still very much be there. And um, there's a very good chance that the world will bounce back um, once the infections pass us. Again, as I say, a lot of this thing needs to be taken with a grain of salt and caution because there are just a considerable number of uncertainties. Um, based on um, Ipsos Mori, a, a survey that's conducted um, quarterly, here you can see that the proportion of people stating that Brexit was one of the top two issues for the government to focus on had fallen from 39% in February of this year um, from a peak of 32% in April of last year. This proportion had declined to just 26% by April this year. By contrast, 35% of people now think that the government should focus on supporting the economy. That's the first time economic concerns have, um, have um, trumped Brexit since um, the referendum was announced um, in 2016. And so that is worth, um, reflecting on as we enter the second half of 2020, mindful that Brexit um, issues still need to be um, addressed. Um, as I said, fiscal policy has been quite uh, proactive in terms of addressing um, uh, economic disruption. And we've had both a furlough scheme and self-employment um, support. Um, we know that taxpayers have been meeting the wage bill for over 9 million workers at a cost of about 15 billion pounds a month, and that 1 million businesses are actually using the scheme. Um, but we do need to be mindful that to avoid widespread job losses later in the year, the government should consider continuing this furlough scheme for sectors of the economy most affected by the shutdown. So those sectors that are um, going to be one of the last to reopen those will need to be um, supported beyond what other sectors that are opening um, today are being given. Let me 
terms of the next slide here, uh, this is the self-employment and income support scheme. Five million people or 15% of the UK workforce are actually self-employed. Um, the scheme here is quite generous in the sense that you can receive the grant, even um, it allows you to continue to work. Um, you can start a new trade or you can take on other employment. And so I think the message here is that fiscal policy in the first instance has been quite generous, um, but that all of these things will eventually need to be paid back in due course, um, most likely through higher taxation. And so the goal of government should be in its transition towards a recovery, um, be more targeted in the support it offers um, and making sure that while there is fairness, that given that different sectors of the economy will be recovering at different speeds, that it then um, uh, removes some of the supports in a coordinated fashion that um, is timed to the needs of the economy. This is just a very busy um, graphic, but it shows how broadly fiscal policy support has been spread and sort of the chronology of it. Um, job losses will crystallize as the furlough scheme is wound down between August and October. And there is a very high likelihood that firms will slash capital expenditure investments um, while households likely will save more than they did pre-crisis. Um, um, but having said all of that, it's very important for economies such as the UK to reflect on um, the past experience since the global financial crisis and that we don't uh, call for a return to fiscal discipline too soon. Um, we did have a lost decade, so to speak, in the UK where we had a, a decade of very severe fiscal austerity that impacted local government um, um, in quite a meaningful way. And uh, that has led to a decade of very low um, economic growth, very low productivity, very low inflation. And so we don't want to repeat some of that um, during this um, recession. This um, shows that the spending on goods and services that involve social contact will be the most affected by the pandemic. And so that's the red bars at the very top of the screen. Um, and um, consumers do appear to have adjusted their spending habits by allocating more money to goods purchases and less to services. So people are less able to go on holidays or go um, to things like gyms or hair salons, and they have been instead redirecting some of that spending to other um, uh, goods purchases. And for my final um, comment will be on a new data tool that SIPFA has come out with in partnership with Zantura. And this is really looking at citizen data, um, sort of segmenting the uh, greater population. Um, the Guardian in last year found that one in three councils use computer algorithms to guide decision makings from how to distribute benefits to identify children at risk of parental abuse. This um, software that Zantura um, um, manages runs the data against a set of risk factors and demographic data, as well as the NHS's shielded list of individuals believed to be most at risk from COVID-19 complications. And it scores households according to the risk profile. Um, it contains no identifying information and it's all based on geographic aggregation. But of course, while we gravitate more towards using these types of uh, data mining tools, um, there are drawbacks and we do need to be very mindful that we address privacy and potential bias issues and that we don't sort of have a reductionist view of the population, just looking at everyone as a number. And this is my final slide, which shows what this data tool looks like. Um, this is, it's called OneView and it has, it's a multi-agency triage tool and case management system. Um, and as I said, it identifies those whose support needs may escalate as a result of the crisis. And so this is how we are working with um, our, the local governments to um, find uh, patterns out of data, big data, and hopefully that can inform the uh, recovery strategy. Thank you very much. Brilliant, thank you very much, Jeff. Um, I can see we've had a couple of uh, comments in the questions box coming through about whether or not these slides are going to be available after the webinar. So just to assure you, we are recording this. Um, the webinar will be made available on our YouTube channel, the SIPFA YouTube channel, um, shortly after 
the event has closed. So you will absolutely be able to view the slides afterwards, share it with colleagues and use it as you use it as you will. So I hope that's useful to all of you. Um, our second speaker is David Phillips. David is an associate director and helps lead two main areas of research at the Institute for Fiscal Studies. So first of that is work on devolved and local government finance with a particular focus on the distribution of funding and the incentives and risks that different funding regimes entail for subnational government. This includes work on the fiscal frameworks of Scotland and Wales and on the ongoing major changes to English local government finance. And second is work on tax and social protection policy in developing countries. So I'm going to hand over to David. Please do keep sending in your questions. Uh, thanks, Ashley. Uh, let me first say I'm really uh, pleased to be joining uh, this webinar today and to be speaking to such a sort of um, important uh, group of key stakeholders uh, on such an interesting and important topic. So what I'll do in my presentation is focus on what the coronavirus crisis may mean for council's revenues and spending. Muted. In particular, how impacts may differ across different types of councils in both the shorter and longer term. Um, now, in the shorter term, those financial amp impacts take two broad forms. Uh, first, are additional demands and costs directly linked to COVID-19 and associated public health measures, as well as broader impacts on operational capabilities. So on the demand side, this could include increases in demand for social care services as a result of, for example, informal care being less available, the knock-on effects of social isolation, as well as the need for reablement services for those that have suffered with COVID-19. On the cost side, it includes things like the provision of personal protective equipment and the re-rotoring of staff to allow for the extra time certain activities take when practicing social distancing and more rigorous hygiene protocols. And councils have actually highlighted postponement of planned efficiency measures as a major cost driver. And these are, for example, second only to adult social care services for the Sagoma group of uh, largely urban authorities in the Midlands, uh, North and the South Coast, for example. The second uh, area of short term pressures is due to the wider economic impact of lockdown and social distancing on councils revenues from local taxes, uh, sales fees and charges and commercial activities and investments. And figures compiled from returns to MHCLG by SIPFA, um, sorry, by the LGA, um, suggests these impacts could make up around 60% of the total financial impact of coronavirus this year, although uh, some of the effects of this won't actually hit budgets until next year. In the longer term, it may of course take some time for the economy to recover, as Jeff was saying, and so these effects are likely to persist for some time. Moreover, changes to shopping, socialising and working habits now could accelerate changes in commercial property usage potentially hitting council's business rates revenues and the capital value of commercial property investments in the longer term. And just as importantly, a wide body of research also suggests that lockdown and the associated recession will have significant and long lasting impacts on the health and well-being of families. And that's likely to have implications for demand for a range of local public services uh, for the foreseeable future. So in the rest of this presentation, I'll actually focus on two areas where I think the evidence is currently clearest. Um, that's the shorter run effects on council's revenues and the longer run effects on demand for local public services. And this is a bit of a preview of a report we have coming out at the start of uh, next week. Of course, the hit to council's revenues is a direct result of the impact of lockdown and social distancing on business activity and households employment income and spending. And this figure, taken from a study by colleagues using data up to the end of April, uh, shows that households across the income distribution have seen falls in their earnings during the coronavirus crisis. Now, on average, these falls amount to around 40 to 50 pounds per week, uh, right across the uh, income distribution, which of course means a bigger percentage reduction in earnings for poorer than richer households. Indeed, um, Whilst one in four of the richest fifth saw their earnings fall by at least 12%, one in four of the poorest fifth saw their earnings fall by at least uh, 32%, almost a third. 
So much bigger falls in income, uh, sorry, in earnings towards the bottom of the income distribution. But it is important to recognize the benefit system is likely to have uh, more of an offsetting impact on the fall in earnings of poorer households than richer households, uh, many of whom will still have income or assets too high to be eligible for support by the benefit system. But those richer households could still have large outgoings that are fixed and they can't cut back. So you might actually expect to see some richer households also struggling um, given the kind of large fixed outgoings um, that they face. Now, job losses and falls in income have led to an increase in the share of households that report their own arrears on their bills. Uh, this figure shows that even prior to the financial crisis, 12% um, uh, of the poorest fifth of households reported to be behind on their bills, as did 8% of the next poorest fifth. And in April, this increased to almost 18% and around 11% respectively, with younger adults, single parents, and people from ethnic minorities all seeing um, significant increases in reported arrears on bills, uh, perhaps reflecting their concentration in lockdown sectors, um, and therefore very likely to job loss, and their limited savings. Now, unfortunately, this particular study um, does not ask about problems paying council tax bills specifically. Um, but another new report, uh, due to be published by colleagues at the end of the month, does look at council tax. And what that finds uh, is that among users of a fintech app called Money Dashboard, council tax payments in April and May fell by approximately 4% and 8% respectively relative to last year, which will reflect both non-payment and increased entitlement to council tax support. So councils in the Sagoma Group, for example, estimate that they collected around 50 million less council tax in April 2020 than they expected with increased eligibility for council tax support counted for just under 40% of this, and non-payment uh, most of the rest. Now, losses due to council tax support won't be recoverable, but losses due to non-payment may be partly recouped uh, through uh, later payment and uh, through enforcement action, of course. The, the falls in income have not only been um, associated with falls in um, people paying their bills, increases in arrears on bills, but also very large falls in household spending. Um, a study by researchers at the Centre for Economic Policy Research using the same money dashboard data that I just mentioned found overall household spending fell by over 40% in April relative to last year. Um, so interestingly, actually, as a significant minority of households are struggling to pay their bills in the face of falling income, most households are in effect actually being forced to save because many of the activities they would usually spend the money on are not possible. But I think that if and when and how those savings are spent can have a really big impact on the speed and the nature of the economic recovery from the COVID-19 crisis. Um, now this figure taken from that study shows there are particularly large falls in discretionary spending, um, things like personal services, restaurants and bars, and non-food retail, and accompanying this has been a shift in spending patterns with the growth in online shopping, in DIY and homewares, and in alcohol and tobacco to be consumed at home. And these changes, of course, in spending patterns, uh, especially if they persist, could have big impacts on councils' revenues from sales, fees and charges, and uh, from business rates and from commercial property investments. Um, but these economic trends will impact differently across councils, um, this isn't only because households and businesses in different areas will be affected and behave differently uh, during the crisis and following the crisis, but also because councils rely on different sources of revenues for very different shares of their overall funding. So um, Shire counties, for example, rely on council tax for 63% of their non-schools revenue expenditure, the most of any class of council. And this means that all else equal, um, they would ultimately be hit harder than other types of councils by a fall in council tax revenue. Uh, in the current financial year, though, they are insulated from these impacts as council tax is collected on uh, their behalf uh, by Shire districts and paid over in agreed instalments that were set before the coronavirus crisis hit. Uh, thus, while Shire districts rely significantly less on council tax for their own revenues, it is their cash flow that we hit this year from falls in council tax receipts. Um, 
counties will be hit next year when instalments for council tax um, for that year are agreed and are adjusted to account for revenue shortfalls in the current financial year. Um, single tier authorities collect their own council tax revenues, of course, with UAs and especially those in the south where properties are more in high tax bands, more reliant on council tax than both London boroughs, where tax rates are often low, and metropolitan districts in the North and Midlands, where properties are often in low bands. Uh, potential uh, exposure to business rates losses is substantially lower, actually, reflecting the fact that a safety net system protects councils from large falls in the business rates revenues. Uh, districts rely most on uh, above safety net business rates revenues uh, for their funding, so about 18% in total, uh, and that reflects the fact they entitle the bulk of business rates revenue growth under the business rates retention system. Uh, counties rely on these revenues uh, the least, about 2% of their revenue expenditure. And moreover, they'll also be insulated from these effects until 2021, when the installments of business rates revenues from shy districts are again updated to reflect shortfalls in collections. Um, changes in sales fees and charges will affect um, all councils in the current financial year, rather than next year. Um, and excluding those derived from uh, social care in schools, this income is equivalent uh, to around 57% uh, of revenues for shire districts, uh, compared to 26% for London boroughs, 16% for unitary authorities, 10% uh, for metropolitan districts, and 5% for county councils. And there are also clear regional patterns uh, with reliance on sales fees and charges highest in London, followed by the uh, south of England, then the Midlands, and finally the north of England. And the final column in this graph, uh, focuses specifically on fees and charges from parking, planning, culture, and trade waste, which seem particularly at risk. And it shows that these are a pretty sizable source of revenue for Shire districts, they're up to 29% of revenue expenditure on average for Shire districts, um, with London boroughs with their high parking revenues, the next at 7%, and Shire districts relying on these sources for less than 1% of their revenues. Now, of course, there's significant variation within classes of council, though. Um, this is also to the fees and charges for the selected services I just mentioned on this map, uh, with darker colours showing more reliance and paler colours showing less reliance on these fees and charges. So for one in 10 shy districts, uh, income from these uh, fees and charges is less than 9% of revenue expenditure, while another um, one in 10, it is over 55%. Um, and there's also significant differences in reliance on above safety net business rates revenue growth as well. And I think what this means is that given an equivalent hit to the local economy, different local authorities are likely to see quite different hits to their overall funding position. Um, differences can be stark even between neighbouring authorities with very similar characteristics. So for example, in Tandridge in Surrey, fees and charges from the aforementioned um, parking, planning, culture and trade waste services equivalent to just 7% of non-schools revenue expenditure, compared to 88% in neighbouring Rygate and Banstead. So you might see kind of quite different impacts on, on sort of very similar authorities. Uh, council serving less deprived council, um, sorry, council serving less deprived areas uh, may be especially exposed to falls in revenue, given they rely on sales fees and charges, and especially council tax for a higher share of their revenue. Um, this graph shows, for instance, that uh, council tax revenues amount to almost 70% of uh, non-schools revenue expenditure for the least uh, deprived tenth of councils, compared to just over 30% in the most deprived um, tenth of councils. Well, that means is obviously a given percentage fall in tax revenues would therefore translate to a much bigger fall in overall revenues for the less deprived areas than the more deprived areas. And perhaps uh, surprisingly, uh, council serving less than five areas have a higher share of their populations working in the sectors such as culture, hospitality, non-food, retail, transport, most affected by lockdown, and hence potentially more likely to either become eligible to council tax support or fail to pay their council tax bill. I think that's surprising because we know that lower earners are more likely to work in these lockdown sectors. Um, but it seems to be low earners living and working in actually less deprived areas. The population of 
less deprived um, areas uh, yeah, are more likely to work in these lockdown sectors. The populations of more deprived areas seem to be less likely to be in work at all or to work in other areas such as say social care or food retail which have continued to operate uh, during uh, lockdown. Uh, moreover, the graph also shows that a higher share of the population is self-employed in less deprived areas too. And uh, this group, whilst uh, Jeff was saying they're entitled to potentially more generous support because they can continue to work and earn money during uh, the point at which they're receiving the self-employment income support scheme, they did have to wait until May, to the end of May and start of June to receive this. So there was potentially a likelihood of them going into arrears on their council tax bills in the meantime. So potentially uh, a bigger issue with arrears, actually more um, affluent, less deprived areas than in the more deprived areas. Um, looking to the longer term though, it's more deprived areas that have populations that look to be more at risk from the effects of lockdown and social distancing on health and well-being. Um, indeed, emerging evidence uh, suggests a range of inequalities are being exacerbated uh, during lockdown. So more deprived council areas have higher levels of mental ill health, uh, for example, around 50% um, higher rates of mental ill health in the most deprived tenth of councils than in the least deprived tenth of councils. And recent evidence suggests that mental health has worsened most uh, during the COVID crisis for those groups that already had the worst mental health. And previous research suggests that health, and especially mental health impacts, can be long-lasting. Uh, so this could be increasing uh, pressure on health and social care services for years to come. But rates of overcrowding are higher in more deprived areas, and specifically in ur urban areas with large ethnic minority populations. And if lockdown is more stressful in overcrowded conditions, leading to increased family tensions, uh, pressure on children's and family services and housing services could be especially likely to mount um, in such areas. More deprived areas also already had higher levels of interaction with children's social services, and unsurprisingly, much higher levels of uh, children in receipt of school meals. Uh, and there's emerging evidence that, that problems can be mounting in both these areas. Um, councils have reported a big decline in the sort of proportion of um, or the number of children uh, being um, uh, having safeguarding concerns uh, raised about them and there's growing concern that these problems if they're not diagnosed early could be mounting and could end up more serious and requiring more serious intervention later on and evidence uh, from a survey of families uh, by my colleagues suggests that um, more deprived students are much less likely uh, to be uh, receiving support from school, to have uh, home work environments that are um, conducive to learning. And actually their parents are much more nervous about sending them back to school. And that could mean that there's sort of um, growing issues both with learning, but also kind of the, the knock-on effects of, of sort of um, falling behind on schoolwork and, um, and, and not sort of um, being in a sort of productive environment. So to summarise or to kind of take away from this kind of, um, you know, quick overview of the evidence on revenue impacts in the short term and spending impacts in the long term, what does this all really mean? Well, I think in the short to medium term, with revenue impacts being a key thing, it's actually more affluent local authorities that rely on local taxes and sales fees and charges that are potentially more at risk in the short term than more deprived areas at least in terms of council finances. And so district councils are especially exposed uh, to these risks. Uh, recognition of this underlies changes in the way the government allocated its two rounds of general funding for councils. The first 1.6 billion was allocated largely on the basis of assessed needs for adult social care spending. And as a result, more deprived areas received more than uh, affluent areas. And the vast majority of funding in two tier areas, in Shire County areas, went to Shire counties, with less than 2% going to Shire districts. The second tranche of funding was allocated instead on a per person basis across England, with districts receiving 35% of the total in two tier areas, um, which overall means they received just under one fifth of the total allocation in two tier areas. And whilst I know this is a controversial decision, especially amongst counties, I think kind of the emerging evidence 
uh, not only from looking at the risk factors, but also some of the more detailed breakdowns of the returns um, from MHCLG does suggest that, that a shift in this approach was uh, sensible. And it could be worth bearing in mind if further funding is made available uh, for uh, later this year. The continued focus on uh, Shire districts likely makes sense. Um, yes, I think, um, yeah, as I said, a continued focus on Shire districts will make sense, as well kind of taking into account the fact that it's not necessarily the most deprived areas that are being hit. But I think in terms of the medium to longer run impacts, it is more deprived areas that may see particular increases in demand uh, for services. And that is certainly worth considering when setting funding allocations for the rest of this parliament. And I think also it's worth recognising that the already postponed fair funding review and business rates revaluations and reviews will be taking place at a time of flux, a time when it's not clear exactly how spending needs will evolve in different parts of the country. It's not clear what the longer run impacts of COVID-19 will be on uh, business value, so pro business property values and business property usage. So I think um, when, when setting policy uh, for fair funding, it'll be important to take that into account. Thank you. Unmuted. Wonderful. Thank you very much, David. And thank you to Jeff as well. Both some brilliant food for thought there. So we're going to turn to our questions now. And to kick off, we have a question. There is a saying that goes, never waste a good crisis. Do you think this crisis should be used to evaluate local public finance capabilities, whether they manage finances soundly or not, with, uh, without, of course, risking the welfare of people? So, David, Jeff, would either of you like to come in on that? Yes, I might come in on that, yes. So I, I do agree that a, a crisis can be an opportunity for, for looking at um, looking at systems and making them fit for purpose. And I think there are many examples of that with policies uh, at the national level. So for example, I think we have been shown that our system of taxing uh, employees versus em self-employed versus company owner managers um, isn't really fit for the task. Um, I think we've been shown that our benefit system uh, has uh, quite significant holes in it. It, it does a lot to support uh, those with uh, low earnings, it does a lot less to support those that are out of work, and it does a lot less to support those that see drops in their earnings that still leave them above, you know, the poverty threshold, but really struggling given their, their high outgoings that they can't necessarily uh, control, like rent and mortgages. Um, so I think it, there are really opportunities to kind of learn from the crisis. Looking specifically at local government, um, if you mean should should government say well let's see if we let councils you know sink or swim what happens i'm not sure i would go quite that far but i think that given that these impacts um are likely to vary quite substantially across the country not just because of the economic impacts varying but because i said revenue mix uh, differs you know substantially even between neighboring authorities i think actually targeting funding at individual authorities to make sure they all can have all their costs covered will be incredibly difficult. Um, trying to develop a formula to, to do that in advance, I think is almost impossible. You'd end up either, you know, giving some councils too little or having to give, you know, you know, many councils too much so that the weakest chain in the link doesn't break. So one thing I think is worth considering is not really sink or swim, but more actually are there flexibilities that councils could be given to see if they can manage the crisis um, you know, themselves and have more flexibility. So, for example, considering relaxing rules on borrowing, so the government hasn't got to provide all the funding up front, it can allow some councils, whether that's because they, they hit harder or they choose to respond more vigorously to some of the issues arising with COVID, for them to borrow funding, borrow money in the short term to pay for those. And the government will then have the option to consider, well, look, do you want to kind of refund some of that borrowing in the future? I think that is something that's worth considering. Jeff, do you have anything further to add on that one? No, I think that was a comprehensive response. Wonderful. We have another question. Is GDP an effective headline economic indicator? If not, what revisions may be beneficial and or are other indicators more appropriate? So, Jeff, do you want to come in on that one? <clears throat> sure. I think <clears throat> I think GDP um, 
is a measure, and I don't think that there's a silver bullet where any one measure will answer everything for um, in a comprehensive way in terms of addressing policy formation. Um, I think it's a snapshot of what's happening in the economy. Um, the ONS is um, regularly trying to improve how GDP is monitored. Of course, the one drawback with how we currently um, track economic output, not just in this country, but in many countries around the world, is that um, as the economy has moved more towards intangible things, so things like software, things that um, surround sort of the whole digital transformation of economies around the world and how societies function, a lot of the, those types of um, outputs um, and, and, and sort of synergies that, that become created um, in terms of economic activity aren't captured um, um, versus how we traditionally have done it with um, tangible things. It's easy to sort of measure you know, a widget or an automobile. Um, it's less easy to track down the full value chain that comes out of the utilization of software um, and how that percolates through society. So I think, and, and these aren't new observations and um, statisticians and economists are trying to improve how GDP is measured. Um, but in the meanwhile, I don't think it's something that we would just say, let's abandon GDP. Um, I think it's, it's a useful tool knowing its limitations and then trying to bolt on additional uh, measures that are available currently to supplement that understanding of how the economy is evolving. Excellent. Um, I think we've got a question can here that I know, Dave, I, sorry, David, go can, ahead. I, can I come in on that very quickly? Um, all I would add on that is I think that, yes, as, as Jeff is saying, GDP is an imperfect measure, but I think it's still a, it's a good measure to capture the overall effects of, um, uh, of what's happening in, if you like, kind of the formal economy, the sort of cash and monetary economy. Now, that matters a lot because it matters for things like tax revenues, which will matter for what it can spend on public services. Um, but it's not perfect because it doesn't capture kind of wider things, you know, for example, wider well-being. Um, so there's a lot of work looking at well-being measures, and there's been some work looking at, you know, well-being during the crisis. And that has shown, you know, big falls in, in more general well-being, especially mental health issues uh, becoming much more to the fore. And I think one thing that GDP suffers from is it's a backwards-looking measure. It's, it's a bit more timely than it used to, but it still is somewhat backwards-looking. So one of the things we're trying to do with our research is, is use more of this kind of real-time data. For example, this money dashboard data, which we can get, you know, with a, with a lag of a couple of days. It shows us really what's happening to the economy, you know, right now. And I think such data could be particularly useful for councils at this time to get a sense of what's happening in the local economy now, what's happening in spending, what's happening to incomes for their residents. Brilliant. Thank you, David. Um, we've got another question, which, David, I know you'll likely have some thoughts on. Um, is council tax an effective and fair method of public sector financing? If not, is it time for, say, revaluation or alternative means of raising such finance? Yes, great. That's a, that's a great question. Um, so we had a report out uh, in March um, looking at the um, issues with the current uh, council tax system and looking at uh, the options for evaluation and reform. So what that argues convincingly, I think, is that we really are overdue revaluation. Um, it has been 30 years almost since council tax was valued in England. Since then, property prices have gone up uh, more than sixfold in London, uh, threefold in the Northeast, more than ninefold in Hackney, uh, two and a halffold um, in the Northeast. And what a revaluation would do, it, it wouldn't, you know, um, multiply everyone's bills by a factor of two and a half to nine, but it would actually redistribute um, bills so they more fairly reflect current um, property values. Uh, rather than values 30 years ago. Um, so I think revaluation is overdue. It would make council tax uh, much fairer uh, than it currently is. I think we could also reform council tax so that rather than it being regressive with uh, respect to property value, um, that it is um, actually, you know, closer to proportional or even proportional to property value, ideally. Um, that would lead to, you know, quite substantial falls for the bulk of the population, especially towards the bottom of the income distribution, 
um, although it would lead to really quite sizable bills for, for those occupying the most expensive properties, um, especially in places like Westminster, Kensington and Chelsea. Um, but again, I think kind of um, consideration is, is required there um, because if one is thinking about, well, we want a more progressive tax system at the end of this um, to, to kind of, you know, um, uh, come out of the crisis, you know, with a, with a more progressive system, um, I think the often, the, the go-to thing is often income tax. But income tax isn't the only tool to increase progressivity. That can be done via other taxes. And actually, uh, taxes on property are often a more efficient, a less distortive form of progressive taxation than taxation of income, which can be avoided by, a, by lots of complicated schemes. So yes, I think we need to continue to have a property tax, but we need to revalue it and you know, reform it as well. And could I just add two um, just very quick observations? One is that um, I think everyone or most people would be in agreement with what David has just um, articulated, which is that the current council tax structure is flawed and can be improved. And I think there's wide recognition of what could be done to make those improvements that David just outlined. Um, but we do need to be mindful of the political realities and that what is ideal from a tax perspective may not necessarily be politically feasible. And I think this is a challenge that um, we continue to work with policymakers in trying to align the time horizons that um, politicians have in terms of you know, the, 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 the political cycle and sort of their motivations and what would lead to more progressive outcomes um, uh, within society at large. And the only second observation I would quickly make is just that you would need to evaluate council tax revaluations in the main, in the broader sense, with other forms of taxation, both within housing markets and outside of the housing system itself. Um, council tax is, you know, it, it, every, it, it's a tax not on the owner, but it's based on the occupant of that property. And so we do need to make sure that the distribution effects of any changes in um, uh, council tax um, banding or rates within um, will have regional um, repercussions just in terms of how house prices have evolved over the past couple of decades across the UK and what that might mean or what the implications would be, not just for owner occupiers, but also for those in the rented sector. Yes, and if you look at our report, we have all those things in there. And I think um, um, we have a, a, a wonderful podcast that I did with Joe Pitt as well for SIPFA, which you can find on the SIPFA website. OK, and we have another question around whether the government response to COVID-19 will mean it is more or less likely that we will make any progress on climate sustainability and or the levelling up agenda. Thoughts? Um, I can take a quick stab at that one. Um, I think it, it the, the recovery strategy will need to be well thought through. I think that there's going to be very difficult decisions um, that government will have to make um, and 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 hopefully government embraces this crisis as an opportunity to progress its agenda not just on climate change but sustainability um, more broadly because climate change is just one aspect of the 17 sustainable development goals that have been outlined by the um, United Nations to which the UK is a signatory and so um, as we introduce more types of uh, fiscal supports um, through policy, um, we need to ask ourselves in terms of, um, for example, in education and training, um, rather than just supporting people into different types of jobs, um, you know, for those people who have been laid off, um, how do we reskill, how do we develop experiences, how do we connect people with not just jobs, but jobs that can move the agenda in terms of, 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 of a green growth and also for this digital transformation that I alluded to earlier. So it's really trying to see how can we connect um, the desired outcomes that we've stated explicitly with policy levers that, um, that will help us get there. And rather than falling on the quick and easy of traditional um, policy mechanisms that will basically get us back to 
where we were pre-crisis, but then the outcomes will be not much different. And so I think that may be an opportunity lost if the um, government doesn't take the bull by the horns, so to speak. And I think just very quickly on the leveling up agenda, I think we want to make sure that, uh, that policies level up across the country and that we don't sort of uh, uh, take a leveling down approach, just given how much we've spent and you know, the, um, everyone is very cognizant that we have come off a decade of fiscal austerity and that this crisis makes that situation that much more difficult to address in terms of leveling up. But we do definitely want to make sure that we're not going down to the lowest common denominator and that we're making sure that um, we support cities, um, that city strategy is still very much there. Um, there's a lot of talk about whether urbanization is dead and whether people are all going to be flocking to the countryside. Um, but we need to be mindful that you know these agglomeration effects and benefits um, that exist in large cities and urban areas are still very much there and that um, that we want to make sure that we pull up those people that may have been feeling left behind with policies that connect them to um, uh, these uh, centers of uh, economic activity and prosperity. Okay, uh, we probably have time for two more questions, two quick ones. So what can we expect from the fair funding review? Will it solve the local government funding issue? Um, so I'll come into that one first. So I think that the fair funding review is overdue. I mean, I understand why they've paused it uh, in the current crisis, um, but aspects of the current crisis have sort of kind of brought to the fore actually that the fair funding review is overdue. The formulas they used to allocate the first tranche of uh, funding, the first 1.6 billion for councils, were based on data and analysis from back in 2013-14. Uh, since then, there's been big changes in population characteristics around the country, with you know further aging of the countryside, um, big increases in population in parts of London, etc. So I think elements of the COVID-19 crisis for local government have shown up uh, the need to go on with the fair funding review. Um, now, having said that, the fair funding review, it, it, it won't solve the, the issues facing local government because ultimately it's not, not about um, the, the level of funding, which is one of the kind of key issues facing local government uh, for the future. Even before COVID-19, it was clear that, you know, the, the plan set out by the current government wouldn't be sufficient to meet rising costs and rising demands, let alone, you know, ambitions to increase the generosity of, of social care, for example. Um, Fair funding doesn't address the funding issue because it's about the distribution of funding rather than um, the level of funding. So I think whilst the fair funding is very important, we need to have a kind of coherent and a fair and a more up-to-date system of distributing funding. There also needs to be a debate about the level of funding, um, how that will be channeled to, to local government and the level of that funding. Jeff, do you have anything further to add on that one? No, I think that, that covered it. Great. So I think we've got time for one more question before we finish up. So how willing does the panel think that local authorities will be to borrow capital for infrastructure investment to help drive recovery? Um, I can have a crack at that one first and then pass it over to David. Um, I think, you know, there's been a lot of focus in terms of how um, comfort commercial investments have uh, affected local government um, wherewithal, um, overall wherewithal to spend and support um, the provision of services. Um, but I think it's worth repeating and, and keeping in mind that, that this was all sort of a symptom of a decade of quite severe fiscal austerity. Um, and so if the way going forward is a more um, balanced and maybe less risky, more conservative approach to um, generating income, uh, uh, generating revenue, then, then what will be the offset in terms of, you know, local governments were, were taking on this approach to respond to um, lack of, 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 of funding. And so um, I don't think we can just say, okay, well, let's have a more um, 
a safer approach. Um, and also, I think it's 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 easy to look at these things in hindsight and say, okay, well, because uh, activity within the commercial sector has collapsed, and then all of you know it, it had been a poor investment. But then, of course, if you had the flip side where things were actually working out well, then what would the response have been? And I think we need to be quite reflect. We need to reflect more deeply as to when times are good or when times are bad. It shouldn't really matter. It should be, you know, how are we? Um, uh, how are these types of policies addressed, whatever the outcome may be? And I think maybe that's a deeper question as to why did some of these things happen in the first place, even before COVID appeared and we sort of got um, the local authorities were hit with the investment decisions. And, and I guess more broadly, just ensuring that these portfolios are just generally more diversified in nature. And maybe that's one of the key takeaways that there needs to be more diversification. Um, maybe the risk level is still um, quite high to address sort of the funding gap, but that you could still achieve higher returns um, but with a more diversified portfolio so that when one um, aspect of your portfolio poor, performs poorly, other parts will sort of buffer that, um, that uh, allocation. And so, um, David, did you have anything else you wanted to say to that? Yes, I guess my thoughts on this, there are, there are two kinds of investments that councils can be thinking about. One is, you know, if you like, investments in local infrastructure that are not really being done for income generation purposes they're not really being done on sort of um you know assets with a kind of capital resale value so investments in 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 local roads um in local um you know council facilities um i think actually you know council spending on those things could be a good form of fiscal stimulus i think councils are likely to borrow relatively cheaply uh, for those uh, given the kind of falls in in um, the government's borrowing costs, um, although I know that the there's the sort of the increment on top of that when you borrow via the, the loans boards. Um, I think the issues with the kind of commercial investment are really quite tricky for councils to be thinking about. Um, there are a number of councils, when we look at the data, that have, that have huge commercial property holdings and are actually really pretty exposed, not just to kind of loss of income, but losses of capital value. I think it's the loss of capital value that's uh, actually the bigger kind of long-term risk for those that have borrowed to invest heavily in commercial property. Um, I think it's a tricky situation because on the one hand, it may look like the opportunities for um, bargains to be bought, especially if you know, private sector credit markets sort of dry up. The, you know, the government sector, the public sector, local authorities might think, oh, actually I can get some bargains here um, and you know, get some capital appreciation as the private market comes back in. Um, on the other hand, you know, I think for the time being, it's pretty uncertain what the long term impact of this will be on commercial property usage. How will it change? You know, how will home working change things? How will the you know further rise of e-commerce change things? Um, so there's there's a big risk that there could be you know even further falls in capital values as those as those things become clearer and and crystallised. So I think it's quite a tricky decision. Um, you know, to balance up you know the the opportunity but also the risk here. Um, and I guess I would just say, you know, yeah, you know, don't put all your eggs in one basket. If you are going to take advantage of, you know, opportunities for bargains, also, you know, hedge your bets to some extent uh, with a sort of broader portfolio. Brilliant. So thank you both. And I'm afraid that's where we're going to have to wrap up for today. Thank you very much to both of our speakers for joining us. Uh, this webinar will be available on the SIPFA YouTube channel shortly. So please do subscribe to watch it back or share with colleagues. You'll also get notifications and access to all of our previous and future free webinars. So thank you very much for joining us and goodbye for now. <laughs>